I'm Robert Magnusson. I'm going to talk to you about nature-inspired nanophotonics or butterfly eureka moment. My business is nanotechnology. I'm going to try to connect what I do in nanotechnology research with what goes on in nature and even things that are commonly observed such as the shimmering wings of butterflies and so on. Uh, here is a summary slide that defines what a nanometer is and uh, we talk about the nano world and the micro world. A nanometer uh, is in terms of uh, millimeters uh, easily understood. Uh, one millimeter has one million nanometers in it. One micrometer has 1,000 nanometers in it. So uh, we can connect with these scales by things we know. For example, a human hair is on the order of 100 micrometers in diameter. Uh, the blood cells that are circulating in your body right now are on the scale of, a, uh, of 10 microns or micrometers in diameter. And the DNA that we all have is on the order of a couple of nanometers, two nanometers in diameter. So this is, these are natural things, natural things with not these types of scales. Man has made a lot of progress coming forward and fabricating things on these scales. There's a lot of uh, electronic and photonic devices that rely on precise nanofabrication technology that is developing rapidly. For example, you see there are some gears uh, and uh, mechanical motor type uh, devices that are fabricated in silicon with scales that are on the order of uh, 10 to 100 microns or micrometers. You see a buckyball there and a carbon nanotube which has a, a diameter of a nanometer and uh, people have stretched these uh, nanotubes across electrodes and actually conducted current across these nanotubes. Nature is a master nanotechnologist. The but butterflies have periodic nanostructures on them that are shown there. Uh, often the feature size on these uh, uh, butterfly wings are on the order of uh, uh, 500 nanometers, for example. And uh, uh, another uh, animal is, is the moth, and a moth's eye has uh, a collection of two-dimensional nanostructures that are on the order of 100 uh, nanometers in uh, diameter. Uh, these nanostructures are anti-reflecting so that light comes efficiently into the moth's eye for the moth to see more clearly. This is like the anti-reflection coating that is put on your glasses when you, when you get a new uh, set of, of glasses, single film that uh, reduces glare. But nature does that like that with, a nano, with nanostructures. You see, if you look closely at floral petals, you see them shimmer. You look at the high angle, you see them shimmer. They shimmer because they are periodic. And you can see uh, scanning electron micrographs off of those uh, petals there. You see features that are on the order of a 500, 300 to 500 nanometers, and you see them undulating on the surface. The flower wants to say to the bees, hello, come and pollinate. I've got some nectar for you. So the, uh, this is used as a reporting tool by nature. Uh, you've seen butterflies. They're lithographic because they're nano-patterned. You see the, the colors shimmer around there the color depends on the scale. There's diffraction and interference uh, controlling the local spectrum that you actually see. If you, if you look at a different angle, you'll see a different color spectrum. So the butterfly is a very beautiful animal indeed. Um, other animals like uh, uh, dung beetles are also lithographic. You can see this uh, animal shimmering there. I found this one uh, in a swimming pool uh, I think he was trying to clean up. How do we imitate nature? How do we imitate nature? We need high precision tools and a lot of uh, practice and theory to design and so on. Uh, uh, and here, here is a nanolithography lab that I operate. And you can see uh, an auth automatic nanolithography system which contains UV lasers by which we draw these nanostructures before we fabricate them. We process them in, in our laboratory. We then etch the masks down into, into durable materials like silicon or glass or something like that. 
we look at these structures after we made them with scanning electron microscopes, namely we use electrons to see the patterns as opposed to looking at uh, things in light as we do as human beings, we can do that. Uh, we have uh, atomic force microscopes, which are like the stylus instrument on your father's record player, or maybe your grandfather's record player. It's an atomic, it's an atomic tip that goes along the surface and measures nano features on the surface. We then, we also have equipment whereby we measure the spectra. We look at the light spectrum that comes off of our devices with the spectroscopic uh, equipment. So here are some examples we've made with these tools. You see a six inch silicon wafer there with about a hundred devices on there. You see them shimmer just like the butterfly wings. We see an array of, of gold nano cups that we fabricated there too. A large scale arrays. Uh, the gold cup is a couple of hundred nanometers uh, in diameter. On the lower left there, there is a, actually a device that one of my graduate students made. It, uh, it's a very beautiful uh, uh, device that reflects light highly efficiently. He, he fabricated a nine by nine arrays of them. You can see them there. And we call, that, call these devices that we make, we call them guided mode resonance devices because we shine light on them and there is a particular resonance effect that takes place and we harness this resonance effect to, to uh, implement devices that are useful in practice. So here is a numerical movie of, of a nano grid. This is a grid of, uh, of semiconductor wires. These wires are 150 nanometers in diameter and 200 nanometers high. You see the mostly empty space. You see the light comes in there and is bouncing back and forth. We, sh we shown this light pulse on almost on a nano grid that has almost no material in it, mostly empty space. You see that the light is still stuck on the wires. So the wire, this grid, captured the light and, and the light is oscillating and bouncing back and forth and re-radiating out of the grid. So it's a very interesting phenomenon that you can capture. So we're storing the light there. It's essentially, essentially a light storage device. And this is the resonance effect that we use in, in these devices that I'm gonna talk about today. It's a very interesting uh, physical phenomenon that we've been studying for some time. So I call this guided resonance technology and here's an application summary Lots of these devices are useful in, for example, telecommunication, medical diagnostic equipment, or laser technology, and so on. For example, uh, frequency selective filters. Filters are used widely in technology. We need to control the polarization of, of these devices. Uh, you, you all have polarized sunglasses. You understand that polarization can be very important. And uh, we have wideband mirrors, and so on. But the, what I'm going to talk about, you see a list of those things. I'm going to talk about two uh, examples, uh, which are the biochemical sensor technology and our ultra sparse reflectors and polarizers, which I'm very excited about because it's new. So uh, the sensor technology was com is commercialized by a small company called Resonant Sensors Incorporated. This technology was invented here at UT Arlington and we hold the patents. UT Arlington holds the patents to this technology. Lots of patents actually supporting this technology. The idea is that we put uh, uh, biological capture molecules like antibodies on the surface of these resonance structures and then when the biomolecular reaction takes place, there is a shift from the baseline, narrow reflect, re, uh, reflection light, a single color of light reflected shift during the, uh, during the biosensing across time until the bios biosensing event ends. So we can follow the capture of the biomolecules across time, from the beginning across time till it ends. So this has many advantages. These sensors are, the sensors are very sensitive. They, are, they are, have high resolution and they're mass producible, but most importantly, they are cost effective. No practical sensor technology will ever become commercialized if it's not cost effective. So there are multiple markets, medical diagnostics, drug development, point of care diagnostics, uh, personalized medicine, environmental monitoring, and so forth. So the pain point that we're trying to solve is that current technology is tag-based. In other words, to see your reaction, you literally have to put a label in the, in the chemical reaction uh, to, to see if something happened. In, in other words, you have to pollute your, uh, your uh, uh, materials to see the reaction. So uh, 
we, for example, there's shown there is a double antibody sandwich immunoassay where you have a capture antibody and you want to see if the antigen came and was captured. And you have to put a big, that big green molecule that is just a label that says something happened. Now I'm going to radiate light to say yes, something happened. This is a very uh, cost uh, intensive and time intensive method. So the painkiller is label free diagnostics. That's our method. Uh, it's real time data. We get re results in a few minutes. Uh, we have a lot of applications, protein, protein, cell based, and so on. And you can see the readers there, and we have basically plates that uh, have, hold the uh, materials, and they're read by this reader. We're developing small point of care systems, which are like on the size of a cell phone with maybe 10,000 sensors in them. That's the next generation of this technology. Now, switching gears, the second application is, uh, is the is ultra sparse devices that are useful for high reflectance and polarization. Scientifically very interesting thing. I ask you the question, if you took a mirror and you removed 95% of the material of that mirror, what would happen? Well, I know if I tried to do that with my uh, mirror in my bathroom, I'd probably cut myself shaving. So, uh, uh, but, but interestingly, we can design these nanogrids. Here's a silicon nanogrid in air illuminated by an unpolarized beam of light. One polarization state is heavily, highly reflected and the other one is transmitted directly through. So there's a separation of the polarization states going on there. And, there's, and across a wide band, you see there's a reflectance versus wavelength there and there's a wide band of, um, of reflection in spite of the fact that only 5% of, of material remains in this, in, this, in this device. So it's really interesting that it's, this would happen. I designed this using theory, and you know, when you do theory, well, theory is theory, right? You have to check it out. So we fabricated a device, fabricated a three by three array of these devices. Silicon, if you look at a piece of silicon, you know that it is not transparent. You look at a silicon solar cell, it's not transparent at all. But you can see we have made the grid so sparse that you can actually read uh, 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 through the grid there. And so these are, this is actually a very nice um, device that was fabricated in my lab. It's, the periodicity is about 800, 800 nanometers. The feature of the ridge is 80 nanometers. So 10% of the material occupies the grid, only 10% silicon in there. And so then we, we say, well, let's take the parameters of the device and do the simulation, we do the calculation compute the response. You see the response there on the left. Uh, and then we measure the device and you see the response on the right there. There's some noise in the spectrum for a real uh, actual experiment, whereas the theory, theory always completely smooth. But you see there's an excellent agreement. And so these, this mirror polarizer technology actually works and it's really exciting for us. Now I call this uh, field guided resonance nanophotonics. It's an application form, trans, uh, platform. It's got lots of application. The detailed physics are largely uh, unexplored. There is a lot more to do there. Very interesting things. You can do 1D or 2D nanostructuring. You can use all kinds of materials, semiconductor metals, dielectrics, all kinds of spectral ranges. Uh, so there are many challenging uh, features left to be resolved. Uh, applications are coming out. I showed you the biosensors. So if I use the famous Rumsfeld principle, Rumsfeld said there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, there are unknown knowns, and then there are unknown unknowns, right? And the unknown unknowns in this field are uh, encircled by the ellipse, and the known knowns is the small ellipse there. Now, our business in research are the unknown unknowns. It's from these unknown unknowns that the new Eureka moments arise. Here are some, uh, uh, here, uh, here, here's, uh, here I acknowledge some of the sponsors, the TI Endowed Chair, the US Air Force, and the National Science Foundation for supporting this work. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>